Welcome to the Misty Bloom Book Club. This is Ada. I hope you're taking care of yourself and doing well. So guys, I'm so proud to be taking you on this lit global journey with me and I can't wait to go even more places with you. It's only episode four and we've been to inner city United States, northern Nigeria, South Africa, and today we're returning to America. Native America, that is. So in this episode, I'll be talking about Lakota Woman by Mary Crow Dog. You ready? Let's get into it. So Lakota Woman is Mary Crow Dog's memoir, and if you remember from episode zero, I mentioned that in the Misty Bloom Book Club, I would be reviewing mostly fiction, and on the rare occasion, would consider nonfiction. So I guess today is the rare occasion. It came early. <laughs> this book reminded me a tiny little bit of Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, not at all in terms of style or substance. They are very dissimilar in that regard. Because Born a Crime is Trevor Noah's account of growing up in apartheid South Africa, while Lakota Woman follows Mary Crow Dog's story as an activist fighting for Native American rights. But my comparison here is in terms of Mary Crow Dog and Trevor Noah being compelling storytellers, not professional writers. And so for that reason, I'm not going to do a typical review of Lakota Woman. I feel like how do you qualitatively assess or critique someone's lived experiences? You really can't judge it, you know what I mean? And also, these are people, Mary Crow Dog and Trevor Noah, just trying to tell us an honest story of oppression. All that really matters is that these are real stories that we should all be paying attention to and be provoked into positive actions. They're not trying to be professional writers, so it feels kind of dishonorable and lame to critique their style of writing, so I'm just not going to do it. Instead, I'll take a different approach and just chat with you about the book, okay? <laughs> I think a great place to start this conversation is to ask, who is a Native American? Because that's a question that always seems to keep popping up in public discourse. And Mary Crow Dog answers this question. She says, I should make clear that being of full blood or breed is not a matter of bloodline or how Indian you look or how black your hair is. The general rule is that whoever thinks, thinks, acts, or speaks Indian is a skin of full blood, and whoever acts and thinks like a white man is a half-blood or breed, no matter how Indian he looks. This book covers Mary Crow Dog's life in the 70s, and it's interesting how 30, 40 years later, people still try to claim a Native American heritage, even though they do not think sing, act, or speak like a native, and do not have any familiarity with native traditions. I wonder what Mary Crow Dog would have thought of today's world, where people benefit from and will fully exercise not being seen in the world as native, but will claim being native when it's convenient and profitable. So your classic case of eating your cake and having it too. I've seen that happen where the majority of their existence in society is as an oppressor, because of course, of the privileges attached to whiteness, and then they switch over to oppressed when they want to benefit from a minor advantage of their native heritage. So basically wanting to participate in the scarce winds, but participate in zero of the struggle, pain, and bloodshed that has to occur for those tiny winds. I've seen people do this. I find it to be pretty dark and disturbing. But moving along, I also want to say that it felt like a treasure and a privilege to read this book. I felt like Mary Crow Dog was letting me, or us, since you're all listening to this, um, into a sacred piece people in tradition that we do not deserve to know about, but she's generous enough to share her people's customs with us. In this case, obviously Lakota, which is a part of the Sioux people. Each chapter in this book starts with a saying or a poem or the lyrics of songs by select Native American people. Chapter 8, for example, starts with what appears to be the first verse of a poem by a young man from Eagle Butte. And it goes like this. I knew when I brought my body here, it might become food for the worms and magpies. I threw my body away before I came here. This verse broke my heart and it feels like desecration to even attempt to dissect it because the verse has said all that needs to be said. And the verse lays bare that even though this book is Mary Crow Dog's story, it is also a chronicle of Native American suffering. And that, my friends, is the proper place to start the conversation. This book has everything. It covers the systematic stealing of indigenous lands by white settlers, the forced sterilization of Native women, including the author's sister. It recounts the organized erasure of Native customs and traditions, the introduction of poverty, addiction, and hopelessness into Native life. So it's both a story of a people 
and a person. Lakota Woman starts out on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota where Mary is raised by her grandparents in a loving but extremely poor home, basically a shack with no electricity or indoor plumbing. The grandparents try to raise the author and their other grandchildren as Catholic and to adopt white culture and norms for practical reasons, you know, to make it possible for their grandchildren to survive in the world beyond the reservation. But it's also heartbreaking where the author reveals that her grandparents still subconsciously will turn to some of the traditional ways to find healing. Because the old ways is their truth, you know? At some point, Mary Crowdog is forced by the government to go to a boarding school, where they employ inhumane methods in unsuccessfully forming her into a good white Catholic girl. The memoir also recounts her time as a young adult trying to find herself in the world, roaming the United States with a band of other footloose and fancy-free native youth also trying to find their place in a world that's been stolen from them. As a sentence in the book reads, He had himself wrapped up in an upside-down American flag, telling us that every state in this flag represented a state stolen from Indians. Whew. It's honestly overwhelming to even think about the depravities that America thrust upon and continues to do to Native America. But anyway, during their youthful, aimless wanderings, Mary Crowdog and her merry band of natives, of course, suffer police brutality and violence from random racists. It is during this time also that Mary Crowdog becomes exposed to AIM, AIM, which is the American Indian Movement. So her memoir also follows her activism in the AIM movement, some of which includes historically significant actions like the March in Washington, D.C., as well as the siege at Wounded Knee. Thereafter, Mary Crow Dog, or Mary Ellen Brave Bird at the time, marries medicine man and civil rights leader Leonard Crow Dog. And she becomes a mother, wife, and stepmother all at the same time at the ripe old age of, wait for it, 18. So Mary Crowdog lived a lot of life in one. But anyway, toward the end, a significant part of Lakota Woman also follows Mary's time as a wife fighting for the release of her husband, Leonard Crowdog, when he's in prison for his activism. So that's a quick snapshot of what the book is about. But before I dive into the details of all the different things that I talked about, just a quick reminder that you can support this podcast by becoming a member of the Misty Bloom Book Club. Membership perks include backstage access to my book list, so you can read along with me in real time, receive a free signed copy of my novel, Oibo, access to my virtual quarterly book club meetings, access to bonus episodes, and so much more. If membership is not your thing, but you'd like to show some love to this podcast, you can leave a tip in the tip jar. Go to www.mistybloom.com for more information. So we're looking at Lakota Woman by Mary Crowdog. In this book, uh, Mary Crowdog spends a lot of time talking about how Native Americans are intentionally and systematically pushed out of society with little to no access to jobs, education, or opportunities, the loss of their language, traditions, and ceremonies, the stripping away of who they are as a people, and them having to turn to alcohol to, you know, deal with the trauma that their lives have become. And in this book, she addresses how alcohol becomes a coping mechanism because people often will say things like, oh, you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Or... Why don't you want better for yourself? And Mary Crowdog answers those questions so well in this book. There's a line on page 54 that took my breath away. People talk about the Indian drinking problem, but we say it is a white problem. White men invented whiskey and brought it to America. They manufacture, advertise, and sell it to us. They make their profit on it and cause the conditions that make Indians drink in the first place. It's the same thing today. Go to the hood. Same situation, same conditions, flooded with liquor stores. Pun intended. Moving along, remember I mentioned earlier that Mary Crow Dog joined AIM, the American Indian Movement? Well, there's a line on page 74, which I thought was really very insightful and articulates what I've always thought about activism and its effects on activists' lives. Here it goes. I recognize now that movements get used up and the leaders get burned out quickly. Some of our men and women got themselves killed and thereby avoided reaching the dangerous age of 30 and becoming elder statesmen. Did you hear what the life expectancy was? 30. This is why I have the utmost regard for activists. They live a principled life and they pay very dearly for it because it is a life that's marred with great sacrifice and suffering. Secular martyrs is what I call them. And while we're on this, here's a quick plug. Please be supportive of and kind and generous to an activist. Something else this book made me reconsider was the meaning of Thanksgiving. While I've always known Thanksgiving to be a troublesome holiday, and that's understating it, I don't think I quite realize the breadth of the pain it causes and represents the Native Americans. I'm going to read a short paragraph from page 75. By the way, this is the author's first encounter with AIM, the American Indian Movement. On page 75, she writes, 
he talked about not celebrating Thanksgiving because that would be celebrating one's own destruction. He said that white people, after stealing our land and massacring us for 300 years, could not now come to us now saying, celebrate Thanksgiving with us. Drop in for a slice of turkey. So, yeah. Okay. So I found something else really interesting on page 77 where Mary Crowdog says, and this is relative to the American Indian movement. We took some of our rhetoric from the blacks who started their movements before we did. Like them, we were minorities, poor and discriminated against. But there were differences. I think it's significant that in many Indian languages, a black is called a black white man. The blacks want what the whites have, which is understandable. They want in. We Indians want out. That is the main difference. It's such a shrewd observation, but I think there's a little bit more nuance that I'd like to offer here based on historical context. So yeah, black people won in on a country that was built entirely and completely on their forced labor. And natives won out because they are indigenous to America with a complex and established civilization until the advent of the white settler state known as the USA. They won out of the white settler state and the return of America to them. But that's my take on Mary Crow Dog's uh, really shrewd observation. I'd love to hear what you all think about this. The author also talks about how being radicalized sent her back to her Indian roots. She writes... To white friends, this may seem contradictory, but for me and my friends, it was the most natural thing in the world. This process had already begun when I was still a child. I felt like the kind of Christianity the priests and nuns of St. Francis dished out was not good for my digestion. Jesus would have been all right, except I felt he had been co-opted by white American society to serve its purpose. The men who had brought us whiskey and the smallpox had come with a cross in one hand and the gun in the other. In the name of an all-merciful Jesus, they'd use that gun on us. Can all the colonists say amen with me? Amen. <laughs> anyway, Mary Crowdog says something that I think is also really profoundly interesting on page 111. I do not consider myself a radical or revolutionary. It is white people who put such labels on us. All we ever wanted was to be left alone to live our lives as we see fit, to govern ourselves in reality and not just in paper, to have our rights respected. If that is revolutionary, then I sure fit that description. Actually, I have a great yearning to lead a normal, peaceful life. Normal in the Sioux sense. That right there is what every oppressed person is trying to scream above the noise of the oppressor. We just want a normal, peaceful life. It's really that simple. Mary Dog also makes another astute point in the book. In fighting her husband's incarceration, Mary Crowdog visits New York for the first time and she's comparing the cost of things in New York versus on the reservation and this is what she says on page 112. Everything was so much cheaper than on the reservation. Where the trading posts have no competition and charge what they please. Everything is more expensive if you're poor. This is an ongoing conversation that I'm always having in real life about how poverty is expensive and capitalism is built and sustained by racism. If you're poor, you're working so many jobs, which is detrimental to your physical and mental well-being because there's no leisure time to recharge. You're not taking time off. You're not taking long walks. You're not hanging out in the park. You don't spend time with your family. You're not going on vacations. And all of these things have a cumulative effect and impact your overall well-being pretty quickly. And so you break down and because you're poor, you can't afford adequate health care. And so you have to pay a massive sum out of pocket or be riddled with debt or both. So yes, poverty is expensive. And think about the demographic of people who typically work multiple jobs to make ends meet. And you realize why I said capitalism is sustained by racism. When you're poor, you also don't have access to quality and affordable, safe foods. So you're spending your scarce dollars on cheap meals that are not good for you. So that also has an impact on your health. And then you develop expensive physical problems that you cannot afford. So there we go again. But when you're poor, you don't have emergency savings. So that when something big happens, you're forced to borrow at exorbitant rates from predatory lenders because you don't have collateral to negotiate a cheaper rate. So it's like wash, rinse, repeat. I could go on and on, but I think you guys already know this. Poverty is expensive. This memoir, as you've seen so far, is full of quotable quotes from page 41, Bill Kunstler, who is the attorney for Leonard Crow Dog. Anyway, here's what Bill Kunstler says. And before I read this quote, when I say they, you, or we in the quote, it refers to the oppressor, okay? They are most afraid of the fact that the claims are morally right. Because when you are confronted with the moral imperative against an immoral imperative on your part, you got to hate the people who assert that moral imperative. And I think there is an irrational guilt-caused hatred now 
that is beyond my ability to analyze. We hate them because their claims are totally justified and we know it. I encourage you to rewind this if needed. This very eloquently explains the oppressor's illogical denial of the claims of the oppressed. This underpins the whataboutisms, the all lives matter, and in my opinion, it's why the oppressed should not devote too much energy to debating the oppressor's arguments because they are irrational and they are committed to their irrationality. To me, the energy is best spent working toward achieving equity and justice. Um, So many things are so familiar in this book. On page 244, Mary Cordog says, and I quote, to me, women's lib was mainly a white, upper-middle-class affair of little use to a reservation Indian woman. I mean, I've always thought the same thing, that the feminist movement is not inclusive of minorities. It felt validating to read this. I mentioned before that reading this book felt like a privilege. And the reason for that is Mary Cordog lets us into Native, or more specifically, Sioux ceremonies. I learned about the peyote, um, the curing ceremony, the traditional Sioux family, which is the Teoshpaye, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's the traditional Sioux word for the extended family unit that people from most indigenous cultures around the world can relate to, and which was, you know, intentionally destroyed by white settlers and replaced with a nuclear family system. I learned about vision seeking, the sweat lodges, which I kind of knew about before, but I learned a lot more about the sacredness of sweat lodges. I learned about the ghost dance, the sun dance. On page 253, Mary Crow Dog writes, and I'm paraphrasing just a tiny bit. In 1883, the government and the missionaries outlawed the dance for being barbaric, superstitious, and preventing the Indians from becoming civilized. The hostility of the Christian churches to the sun dance was not very logical. After all, they worship Christ because he suffered for the people, and a similar religious concept lies behind the sun dance, where the participants pierce their flesh with skewers to help someone dear to them. The main difference is that Christians are content to let Jesus do all the suffering for them, whereas Indians give of their own flesh year after year to help others. The missionaries never saw this side of the picture, or maybe they only saw it too well and fought the Sundance because they competed with their own Sundance pole, the cross. Yo, Mary Crow Dog just roasted Christianity. <laughs> But I have to say something really quickly. It also made me cringe to read this because I thought about the Sundance channel and they should consider renaming it. So I'm going to end this episode and close out with page 262, which is the epilogue. Mary Crow Dog ends with a recap of the activists associated with the American Indian movement who participated in the siege at Wounded Knee. She says... Those are the survivors. Many of the former brothers and sisters are dead. Some were killed, but most died from natural causes. I think that the wear and tear of the long struggle just burned them up, ruined their health, and took years off their lives. The best always die young. And this, like I said before, is the high price of activism. Finally, Mary Crow Dog, while being an activist herself, also discusses the other perspective, which is the toll that being the wife of an activist can take. And she writes... Cooking and cleaning up for innumerable guests, most of them uninvited, listening to countless woes and problems became too much for me. I was going under. Wherever Native Americans struggle for their rights, Leonard is there. Life goes on. And just so you know, Mary Crow Dog died at only 58 years old. And there, my friends, I think, is a poignant place to end. Thank you for hanging out with me on this episode of the Misty Bloom Book Club. Don't forget to like, share, leave a comment, and subscribe to find me on social media or to contact me for sponsorship opportunities. Or if you'd like to become a member of the Misty Bloom Book Club and enjoy all of those wonderful perks, go to www.mistybloom.com for all of my information. Be sure to check out my novel, Oibo, spell O-Y-I-B-O, on Amazon. Until next time, keep reading, stay lit, peace and love. Thank you.